when ViewSonic mentioned that they've got the Elite XG251G for review, I was very much intrigued. However, when I found out that it was a full HD 360Hz IPS gaming monitor at £600 in the UK and $600 in the US, I just said to myself, seriously? Yeah. Anyway, in this review you can see if it's actually worth its price tag and if hardcore competitive gamers like myself should actually purchase it. Now to kick off this video I do want to talk about connectivity and here the monitor has got a singular DisplayPort 1.4 input which is perfect for Full HD at 360Hz but then the manufacturer has chosen to include two HDMI 2.0 inputs. It's baffling not to see 2.1 standard in this day and age and at a monitor of this price point. Now the reason I'm highlighting this is because if you have got a modern day laptop or a graphics card with HDMI 2.1 then you're going to be limited by the port versions of this monitor and as such means that you're going to be capped at full HD at 240Hz and as a result means that you'll probably want to look elsewhere or indeed save yourself some money and get a 240Hz monitor altogether. Now with that in mind I have an RTX 3080 and I was able to connect over DisplayPort and therefore output Full HD at 360Hz. Now the question is, is 360Hz actually something that you should be getting over let's say 240Hz or 144Hz? Now of course over 144Hz it will feel a lot more fluid, although the actual breakdown of the numbers and the differences that you'll actually see on your screen are quite minimal. I've actually got a detailed breakdown of this down in the description below so I definitely do suggest you check that out. But then moving from 240Hz up to 360Hz, I really struggle to see the difference. Yes, it does feel a little bit more fluid, but I feel that it's a little bit more placebo more than anything. Now this is coming from someone who's reviewed over 200 different monitors and has over 2,500 hours of competitive CSGO playing at a very high level. As a result, I can just say to myself that if I was going to be getting a monitor over 240Hz, I can't really subjectively see the differences. But of course, you might disagree with me, so do let me know in the comment section below, and of course, do let me know if you'd like to see a dedicated video of 240Hz plus monitors compared. Now with that out of the way let's get on to its gaming performance and let's kick off and talk about its input lag. Now here I had it objectively tested at 2.8 milliseconds which isn't the lowest that I've tested to date but is still very impressive. Subjectively I will say that my mouse clicks were being registered extremely quickly and left me with an absolute smile on my face. I had no problems worrying about the monitor's input because it was stupidly fast and therefore meant that it was very much tuned for hardcore competitive gaming. Now on the subject of the monitor's input lag, you have also got the NVIDIA Reflex Analyzer tool built in. And this gives you the ability to actually see the overall latency of your system, including your mouse, at least if it is supported. You'll have to plug it in via the USB Type-A port that's found by the monitor's display inputs. Now personally, I think it's somewhat of a redundant feature that NVIDIA provides, because it doesn't allow you to really optimize the overall input lag or the signal delay, but rather it's just an informative piece. I'll be intrigued to hear your thoughts of this feature down in the comment section below as to if it is something that you would actually see yourself using or is a feature that you would actually look out for when purchasing a monitor. Now its input lag is very impressive so what about when it comes to its response time? Well 3D Monitors OSD you've got three different overdrive modes to select from, standard, advanced and super fast and here you can see the differences on your screen on the UFO ghosting test. Now indeed over here ultra fast does incur a little bit of inverse ghosting but we'll touch upon this very shortly. Now it's worth noting that ULMB, in other words the ultra low motion blur mode which really does clear up the UFO is unavailable at 360Hz and as a result is only available at 240Hz or under and as such means that you're going to have to downscale this monitor. I find that quite disappointing given that people who are buying this monitor will potentially expect 360Hz and ULMB to be working in tandem them, but alas that's not the case. Now to expand on this let's dive on to the numbers and here by the OSRTT tool you can see I had it tested on its standard mode presets with an average initial time of 3.1 milliseconds. There's barely any RGB overshoots which is in other words like purple trailing. Now if we move over to the advanced preset you can see a lot more red and therefore suggest 
suggesting that there's going to be much more purple trailing and yet the average initial time doesn't actually drop it sits at 3.15 milliseconds similarly on the ultra fast preset the rgb overshoot becomes even worse and then the average initial time sits at 3.09 milliseconds now what I will say subjectively is that playing through these different modes, I had no sole problem playing on CSGO. In other words, I didn't have too much purple trailing or ghosting that was occurring and as such meant that I was perfectly content using the ultra fast preset on a game such as CSGO. However, playing more graphically intense games, I actually found myself dialing it down to the advanced or the standard mode presets because it was a little bit better on terms of the lowered RGB overshoot. Effectively, it really depends on to you, but what I'm trying to portray over here is that playing hardcore competitive games, you should have no problems running on the highest mode presets. Now moving past the 360Hz overdrive modes, what about when it comes to 240Hz? Well here I did test it via the OSRTT tool and you can see that on the standard mode preset it gets 3.34 milliseconds. Moving down to advanced you have got 3.15 milliseconds and then you get to a stonkingly low 2.75 milliseconds on the ultra fast preset. Now you might have noticed that there's no ULMB figure and that's because via my current testing methodology I can't actually measure it via the OSRTT tool and I do not have an oscilloscope. Now what I will say here is that it can be somewhat likened to the ultra fast preset. As a result I can only imagine that the ULMB mode is similar to the 240Hz ultra fast modes that I actually tested and as such you can potentially use these figures to imagine as to how ULMB mode will be performing and the overall average initial time that you should be able to attain. Now on the subject of ULMB I would like to point out that it will not run simultaneously with Nvidia G-Sync. Indeed in my case I have an RTX 3080 and when connected over DisplayPort I was not able to run 240Hz with G-Sync and ULMB mode all running simultaneously together. However, if I were to disable NVIDIA G-Sync and then enable HDR, it did run with ULMB, which is nice to see. It's just worth considering because some people would have potentially expected NVIDIA G-Sync to be running simultaneously with ULMB, but alas, that's not the case, and there's some of its competitors that do actually offer both technologies to be working in tandem. Now, this does perfectly bring me onto its VR technologies, and indeed, in this case, I was able to test NVIDIA G-Sync of course disabling ULMB and actually going at 360 hertz. Now in this setup I had no problems whatsoever running the NVIDIA Pendulum demo or indeed playing Destiny 2. I didn't incur any sort of black screen issues or any sort of flickering. It was a buttery smooth experience. Now you do also have the ability to enable HDR and in my case I was able to run HDR with NVIDIA G-Sync at full HD at 360 hertz and this set up over display port didn't cause any problems either. Now the overall HDR experience is going to be subdued because the monitor is rated at HDR 400 and can't compete with monitors that have HDR 600 or above. Nonetheless, the overall color accuracy and the image still popped and as a result the overall HDR signal was agreeable and was something that I could see myself using if I was playing a game such as Destiny 2. Now moving swiftly on, I should point out that if you are a hardcore PC gamer but then also would like to play on console via this monitor then it should be able to support Full HD at 120Hz. I have no means of verifying it with a console, however via my computer I was able to output 120Hz at Full HD via my HDMI port. So with the gaming section out of the way, let's get on to the overall image quality and here you've got a 24.5 inch IPS panel that runs Full HD at 360Hz. It also has a dedicated sRGB emulation mode that you can select through the OSD. In said mode, I actually found it to be very impressive, with a tested gamut coverage at 94.5% and a gamut volume of 94.6%. You can see here the average LTE sits at 0.91 and a maximum of 2.18. You can see below how it compares to the sRGB standard. Now the contrast ratio is decent for an IPS panel at 1156 to 1, and as for the 
the measured white point in comparison to the 6,500 Kelvin target, it actually gets quite close at 6,782 Kelvin at 100%. Similarly here, the gamma curve sits pretty close to the 2.2 standard. Now what I will say here is that the sRGB mode preset 3D OSD does give you the utmost best color accuracy, at least in comparison to the sRGB standard. However, if you were to go on the native mode preset or even on the user mode preset and then enable the sRGB gamma clump via the OSD, you will still achieve excellent numbers. Actually, they were very, very similar to what I actually achieved on the sRGB mode, so much so that I didn't feel that I had to reiterate it. Effectively, if you are going to be editing in the sRGB color space, then you might actually want to go on the native mode because here the overall brightness level isn't capped. Speaking of which, this does bring us on to peak luminance and here in HDR, I had it tested at 383 nits, which is a little bit below what it should be achieving because it does get the HDR4 400 specification, therefore it should achieve over 400 nits. Nonetheless, in SDR I got an impressive 368 nits, and as for ULMB, it's still perfectly playable at 188 nits. As you can see here, the sRGB mode does limit it to 107 nits and is locked, and to me that is pretty dim. Given that, if you are going to be gaming in a very dark room, you will be pleased to know that it gets all the way down to 36 nits. Now moving on, we get on to brightness uniformity, and on the tested panel, which is of course somewhat panel lottery, it is D Decent, although you can see at the top half it is not as good as it should be. Similarly when it comes to the overall backlight bleed I found it perfectly acceptable. However if you are susceptible to backlight bleeds then you might want to look at a VA panel or for example a TN panel altogether. So moving on we get onto the monitor's OSD that can be accessed through a physical joystick button found underneath and at the center of the monitor. Now through the OSD you've got a plethora of different options. You've got the different game modes that you can select and I'd very much suggest not using the G-Sync eSports because it really just boosts up the contrast ratio and just looks really horrific, at least to my eyes. Now through the standard mode however you can adjust certain settings such as dark boost, blue light filter and the response time settings which I did touch upon before in the gaming section and of course you have got ULMB but you can see here it's greyed out because we're running at 360 hertz rather than 240 hertz. Now here in display you have also got the brightness, the contrast, six axis color and then a color temperature whereby you'll probably want to run on the native mode versus sRGB because then it's not locked in terms of the brightness and yet you still do get fantastic color accuracy as I did cover in the image quality section of this review whereby you'll probably want to enable the sRGB SDR colors. Elsewhere you do have the SDR variable backlight which you might want to enable depending on the games that you're playing and then certain other settings that you might want to play around with. Now moving on we have got the G-Sync processor whereby you've got the NVIDIA Reflex Analyzer tool and this allows you to customize it and make sure that it is set up in the correct way and of course you can enable or disable it through this mode over here so if you're not going to be using it you might want to just disable it altogether and then you have got the ability to enable a, a FPS for example so a number that's showing on your screen via the monitor. Then you've got the input select which is pretty self-explanatory and then you've got the audio adjust. Now this monitor has got two times two watt speakers and they're somewhat tinny and not that great. Quite frankly if you're getting this monitor you probably have a set of headphones or bookshelf speakers at the very least so you're probably not going to want to use this but nevertheless it does have some speakers. Now then going from here we have got the setup menu and you've got the resolution notice and some information as to how it's currently running. Then you have got some quick access modes that you can set through this whereby it's a button found on the left hand side that allows you to adjust certain settings on the fly. You can enable or disable a crosshair and then you've got the Elite RGB. Now these are lights that reside at the back and underneath the monitor. Not something that I'll ever see myself using but if you do want to use it you can use the Elite Display Controller app, in other words the software to customize the RGB lights to your nth degree or if you go via the OSD if you disable it to over here you can enable always on or off and then change between the base and the rear colors as I mentioned it's not something I use so I completely disable it so moving on from the monitors OSD we get onto its stand and here it has got a fully adjustable one whereby you've got height tilt pivot and also swivel adjustment the stand itself that comes built in is very sturdy as well if however you'd like to replace it, you can also get a Visa compatible stand because this monitor does support it. 
Now as for the monitor itself, it hasn't got a garish design unlike some of its competitors, although do bear in mind it has got those RGB lights but you don't have to use them if you don't want. And then it's also got a three side borderless design with a relatively low profile bezel and therefore means that it's not going to take up too much space on your desk and should fit on most sort of setups. So with all of that in mind it brings me on to my verdict and quite frankly the ViewSonic Elite XG251G is actually very impressive when it comes to its gaming credential. Full HD 360Hz might not be overly enticing but its overall input lag, response time and even its HDR reproduction though it's limited to the HDR400 spec are all very good. As a result it gets my performance award. However, at the time of review and at least in the UK and in the US where it can be found for £600 and $600 respectively, it is absolutely grossly overpriced and definitely Bruce Lee would not be proud. As a result, you might want to look at some alternatives such as 1440p 240Hz panels from Samsung, Alienware or indeed AOC and then you've also got fantastic 1440p 144Hz or 1080p 240Hz or 280Hz monitors from the likes of BenQ, AOC or indeed Asus. All these monitors that I've mentioned so far will be down in the description below for your own consideration. Now I'll be intrigued to hear your thoughts of this monitor down in the comment section below and if you've liked this independent detail review definitely do drop a like, subscribe and hit that bell notification. All of which are greatly appreciated and allows me to continue delivering honest reviews like this one. As such I've been totally dubbed and I'll hopefully see you in the next one. Take care of yourselves and goodbye.